Imagine a missile so fast, so utterly relentless, that by the time your radar even pings it, the only thing left to do is watch the replay. What if the very rules of aerial warfare were rewritten overnight? China's CJ-1000, often whispered about as the long sword, isn't just another weapon. It's the world's first hypersonic cruise missile built specifically to hunt aircraft, not ships or bunkers, aircraft. We're talking 6,000 plus kilometers of range, Mach 5 plus sustained speed, and a nose pointed straight at the Achilles heel of every modern air force. Those lumbering, mission-critical tankers, the all-seeing spy planes, and the indispensable early warning birds. Today, we're cracking open the physics, the strategy, and the plane scary math behind what could very well be the world's first true hypersonic plane killer. For 70 years, the playbook has been pretty simple, hasn't it? You put your precious assets as far back as possible, flood the sky with tankers, let the AWACS peek over the horizon, and then let the fighters do the sharp end of the fight. Those big, slow tankers and the radar bristling porcupines are the invisible glue of every western air campaign, from Desert Storm all the way to Ukraine's backyard strikes. They're the eyes, ears, and fuel pumps that let modern air power project force across continents. Take them out, and those sleek fighters suddenly grow shorter legs, blinder eyes, and a whole lot more stress. Until now, the only realistic way to reach them was by sneaking a piloted fighter past escorts, or perhaps a suicide drone past point defense systems, or maybe firing a ballistic missile that costs more than the fuel it's trying to destroy. The CJ-1000, though, it doesn't just flip that board over, it smashes it. It can launch from a mobile truck deep inside mainland China, scream across the Pacific, and swat a KC-135 from the sky before that tanker's crew can even finish their coffee. Think about it. One weapon, one mission, one very bad day for the delicate balance of air power. It's a game changer, and not in a good way for current defense paradigms. Officially, you might see it called the YJ-1000, and export brochures might list it as the CJ-1000, but insiders, the ones really paying attention, just call it the long sword. This isn't a ballistic loft and dive weapon, mind you. Instead, it's a surface-launched, air-breathing, scramjet-powered hypersonic cruise missile. What does that translate to in plain English? It means it stays inside the atmosphere, hugging the thinner air above 30 kilometers, and keeps the throttle pinned at Mach 5 plus for the entire trip. This isn't your granddad's ICBM. It's a different beast entirely designed to stay within the atmosphere and exploit its unique properties. By staying low enough to bend radar horizons, yet high enough to avoid sea-skimming clutter, it sidesteps two layers of traditional defenses at once. The booster rocket drops away after a mere 30 seconds, the scramjet throat opens wide, and then the missile accelerates again, yes, accelerates, until it's cruising faster than a rifle bullet for two full hours. That, my friends, isn't a sprint. That's a marathon at an impossible, terrifying speed. Its sustained flight capability is what truly sets it apart, making it a persistent and far-reaching threat. Let's talk intercept math for a moment, because this is where things get truly gnarly. A Patriot Pack 3 missile, a formidable defender in its own right, has about 12 seconds of useful engagement window against a target coming in at Mach 3. Now, double that speed to Mach 6, and that window halves. Plus, the interceptor missile has to pull something like 40 Gs just to turn inside the incoming track, which is a monumental challenge for any airframe. Now, add a 6,000 km range, which means the launch point can shift a thousand miles inside friendly borders, and you've effectively erased the forward deployed launch detect queue. By the time an early warning satellite spots that tell tale infrared plume, the CJ-1000 is already at scramjet speed and steering its waypoints around known destroyer patrols. Even if an SM-6 somehow manages a side shot, the long sword can jink at 8G in the thin upper air, something no ship-launched interceptor can realistically match at that altitude. The blunt truth, the one defense planners hate to admit, is this. Current arsenals aren't designed to swat a hypersonic cruiser. They were built to stop either ballistic re-entry vehicles at space vehicle speeds or sea skimmers at aircraft speeds. The CJ-1000 lives in the gap between those two threat sets, and that gap, right now, 
is a massive, gaping blind spot. It's like having a baseball glove designed for slow pitches, suddenly trying to catch a bullet. The tools just aren't suited for the job. Beijing's planners didn't build this thing to chase nimble fighters. They built it to erase the support orchestra, to dismantle the entire system that enables modern air power. Priority 1, hands down, goes to aircraft like the KC-135, KC-10, KC-46, and Australia's future KC-30A. Kill the tankers, and an F-35 flying from Cadena has maybe 400 miles of combat radius before it must turn back or, well, swim. Priority 2? That's for the AWACS and J-STARS, those iconic flying radar domes that hand over mid-course guidance to fighters and spot cruise missiles for the fleet. Without them, the wall of linked data shrinks to the size of each pilot's own radar, and that's roughly the size of a dinner plate when you're up against stealth opponents. It's like fighting blindfolded, each fighter isolated in its own tiny bubble. And then there's priority 3. SIGINT and electronic warfare platforms like the RC-135 and EP-3 that vacuum up radio waves and map enemy defenses. Erase those, and the enemy is essentially fighting with a flip phone in a 5G war zone. The CJ-1000 Seeker is advertised as multi-mode, which means it has terminal active radar plus passive homing on radio frequency beacons. Translation. If the target aircraft keeps its radar on, the missile homes in on those emissions. If it goes silent, the missile flips to its own radar and still finds a 747-sized tanker. Either way, the math ends with a mid-air funeral. 6,000 kilometers is a curvy but straight-faced number, isn't it? From mobile launchers parked near Wuhan, a CJ-1000 can reach Guam, circle overhead, and still have enough fuel to chase a tanker sprinting south toward Australia. Park the launcher on Hainan Island, and the weapon can overfly the Philippines, kiss the edge of Alaska's radar fence, and swat a KC-46 heading to refuel F-22s over Taiwan. These aren't theoretical red circles on some think tank map, they're live calculus homework for US Indo-Pacific Command every single day. This isn't just about hitting a target, it's about forcing a complete re-evaluation of every critical asset's placement, pushing them further and further back, out of optimal operating zones. And because the truck launcher looks identical to a thousand other Chinese 8x8 cargo haulers, preemptive targeting becomes nothing short of a guessing game. Satellites can spot hardened bunkers, sure, but they struggle to tag a green box truck hiding under a highway overpass. Mobility plus range equals survivability, survivability equals deterrence, and deterrence, my friends, is the coin Beijing is spending with alarming effectiveness. The missile carries a 200-kilogram high-explosive fragmenting warhead, roughly the same punch as a standard missile 2 Block 3. That sounds modest, maybe even a little underwhelming, until you remember the closing speed. At Mach 6, the kinetic energy alone equals 6 tons of TNT. So, the actual explosive? That's just confetti on a bullet that is already a meteor. Imagine a car crash at 6 times the speed of sound the explosion is almost secondary to the sheer destructive force of impact. The fragment pattern is specifically designed to cut through wing spars, fuel lines, and the delicate rotating radar inside an AWACS dorsal dome. One contact, one shattered node, one air campaign limping home at best speed. And here's the kicker, because the missile is reusable platform cheap, think tens of millions, not hundreds like a DF-21, China can salvo fire dozens without asking Congress for an emergency budget. Quantity, as we all know, has a quality all its own, especially when each shot travels faster than a rifle bullet. It's a brutal equation where a relatively inexpensive weapon can disable an incredibly valuable asset. Russia's 3M22 Zircon is sexy, no doubt about it, but it tops out around 1,000 kilometers and is mainly aimed at ships. The USAGM-183 ARRW, despite all the hype, just failed four flight tests in a row and is, regrettably, back on the drawing board. India's BrahMos-2 is promising, yes, yet it's still on the test bench and limited to 600 kilometers under export rules. That leaves the CJ-1000 holding a lonely, formidable record, it's operational, it's truck mobile, it boasts a 6,000 kilometer range, and it's purpose-built to erase aircraft, not asphalt. Even America's old reliable Tomahawk can't match the speed, 
and the hypersonic gliders on both sides are short-range, ballistic-launched weapons. In other words, the long sword isn't just first in class, it is currently in a class of one, carving out a new domain of threat that no one else has quite mastered yet. Defense planners absolutely hate talking money, but lethality, at the end of the day, is always a balance sheet calculation. An SM-6 missile costs about $4 million, a CJ-1000, on the other hand, likely costs $20 million. Sounds like good odds for the defender, right? Until you realize that $20 million missile might be heading for a $250 million tanker stuffed with secret comms gear and priceless operational data. Fire two SM-6s to be sure, add a destroyer on station for a month to provide that defense, factor in the airborne patrol burning fuel to guard the guard ship, and suddenly, the ledger flips fast. Now, multiply that by 50 tankers and radar birds across an entire theater of operations. Suddenly, the cost equation looks like a subscription the Pentagon simply cannot afford, while Beijing pays once per missile and walks away, having severely degraded an adversary's capabilities. This isn't just a tactical problem, it's a strategic drain, forcing defenders to spend exponentially more to protect assets than the attacker spends to threaten them. Strategic math is brutal. If it costs more to stop a weapon than the target it protects, deterrence wins even when the interceptor hits. That's a checkmate no one wants to face. Off-record chats with F-22 drivers, the creme de la creme of air superiority, reveal a quiet worry, a deep-seated unease. We train to fight without AWACS, but we've never had to do it for real since 1991. Tanker guys, predictably, are even blunter. If they can hit us from the mainland, we need new bases or new tankers, period. The Aussies, who fly the massive KC-30A, joke that they'll need to refuel from Darwin and then sprint in, but the CJ-1000's range even makes Darwin a day one target. No one is throwing helmets in lockers in despair, but they are rewriting checklists, spacing formations wider, and demanding tankers that can refuel, then dash another thousand miles before the bingo light even blinks. The psychological shift is already priced in, the hardware shift, the fundamental re-equipping, is lagging dangerously behind. The unspoken fear isn't just about being shot down, but about the mission becoming impossible, about being rendered irrelevant before the fight even begins. Directed energy is the hopeful buzz, isn't it? The idea of 300 kilowatt lasers burning holes in thin-skinned cruise missiles. Problem is, there's humidity, there's dust, and then there's the inconvenient fact that a hypersonic object is wrapped in a plasma sheath that absolutely loves to scatter light. Microwave weapons? Maybe, if you can hold the missile inside a tight beam for a full second while it screams across the horizon. The atmosphere itself becomes a formidable ally for the missile, scattering energy and making a precise, sustained beam lock incredibly difficult. The honest answer, the one that keeps planners awake at night, is layered defense. Kill the launcher on the ground, blind the sensors that cue it, jam the mid-course updates, and then throw a wall of interceptors in front of the terminal dive. Every layer works a little, none work perfectly, and the enemy only has to leak once to achieve their objective. Until somebody fields a space-based interceptor with reaction time measured in milliseconds, the CJ-1000 will keep those planners awake at night, staring at the ceiling. Japan is bankrolling joint glide vehicle research with the US, France just flight tested a scramjet prototype, and Australia's hypersonics spin-up promises reusable engines by 2027. All worthy efforts, undoubtedly, but all undeniably late to the party Beijing is already hosting. The long sword didn't just pop out of a lucky lab accident, it rode 15 years of sustained, focused funding that Washington repeatedly chopped, changed, and restarted. While Congress debated budget lines and strategic priorities, China test-fired, tweaked, and truck-mounted. The takeaway isn't that the West lacks brainpower, it lacks continuity, a consistent long-term vision. It's a stark reminder that sustained, focused investment, even on seemingly distant threats, eventually pays dividends, or rather, delivers devastating new capabilities. Weapons that travel at a mile per second simply do not tolerate policy whiplash. Pentagon war games now routinely assume the CJ-1000 enters any Taiwan fight in the opening salvo. First wave. Crater runways and airfields. Second wave. Snap the tanker and AWACS neck. 
Without those critical enablers, U.S. fighters must stage from Guam or northern Japan, a thousand-mile swim that shrinks on station time to mere minutes. China's own fighters, handily based along the coast, suddenly own the endurance edge, operating from home turf. That inversion, the home team with longer legs, dictating the tempo, flips the classic American model of expeditionary air war completely on its head. No one is predicting outright defeat, but every analyst quietly pencils in higher losses, slower reinforcement, and a political clock that ticks louder than the military clock. That, my friends, is deterrence in action. Raise the price until the intervention promise sounds too expensive, too costly, to keep. How deadly is the CJ-1000? Deadly enough that a single weapon can force an entire air force to restage, replan, and fundamentally reimagine what air superiority even means in this new hypersonic age. Deadly enough that a 200 kilogram warhead can cripple a $250 million aircraft by sheer kinetic spite. Deadly enough that defending against it costs more than the target it protects, a balance sheet checkmate strategists absolutely hate to admit. The CJ-1000 is not science fiction, it is road mobile, it's been tested, and it's reportedly deployed in limited numbers right now. Whether it truly revolutionizes warfare or simply gathers dust in a bunker ultimately depends on the willpower and the wallets of the nations it is aimed at. But one thing is certain. The era of sanctuary skies for lumbering tankers and radar domes is closing fast, and the long sword is the sharp, undeniable tip of that new, unnerving reality. So, what do you think? Do hypersonic plane killers make manned fighters obsolete, or will defense tech catch up before the next major conflict? Drop your take in the comments below, and if you want more no-fluff military tech breakdowns like this, hit that subscribe button and ring the bell so you don't miss our next deep dive.